Are you a business owner looking for real advice and input? You're in the right place. From concept to launch to growth, funding and beyond. Welcome to Startup Hustle with your hosts. One once sold a business for $150 million. The other, the author of Million Dollar Bedroom. Here are your hosts of Startup Hustle, Matt DeCourcy and Matt Watson. And we're back. Another episode of Startup Hustle. Matt DeCourcy here with Matt Watson. Hi, Matt. What's going on, man? It's another day in Q, baby. Q time is due time. How are I you doing, I'm, man? I'm not doing very good. I, You know, this quarantine and having to cut my own hair thing is not good. And I feel like I need a support group or something. You know, Maybe there, some there, tips on how to cut my hair. So what, why all of us have been, have, have been forced to embrace social distancing, there is a form of community that you can get into and be involved with where you can get as close to everyone as you want, as long as it's online, Matt, that is a digital health community. Oh, yeah. So, and, you know, it just happens to be that our needs are immediately met by the person that is joining us on Startup Hustle today. Now, before I introduce him, once again, today's episode of Startup Hustle is brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software development team quickly and affordably. With us today, we've got Mike Perath, who is the CEO and founder of The Mighty, one of the strongest sounding names of any company that has been on Startup Hustle before. They're located in LA. Now, you know I like it when you're interactive, so go check out The Mighty. Com. And while you're doing that, hello, Mike. Hello, guys. How are you guys doing? We're hanging in there, man. Happy to join your digital community, though. <laughs> Glad to have you here. Well, you know, we like to say that the mighty sounds, it does, it sounds so strong, almost superhero level. And every superhero or comic book has an amazing backstory. Let's start with yours. Uh, so my background, I spent most of my career as a journalist. I worked for mostly big media companies, um, ABC News, NBC News, New York Times. And um, as I was kind of growing professionally, I had the first, my wife and I had our first of, we have four kids now. And um, our daughter was, um, uh, it took us a couple of years to really get a diagnosis. Um, she had a lot of challenges. She has a rare disease called Duke 15Q syndrome. And for, for her, it means she's autistic and has a bunch of other challenges, uh, what my wife and I discovered is the thing that helped us most was connecting with other people. It was not waking up every day and reading WebMD to try to figure out all the ways we could help our kid. Um, it was, you know, hearing from other folks that had been in our shoes before as well. And um, and that was really the the, the beginning of it. I, I played around with this idea of there, there should be a much larger community in health that helped people. It's really the power of those shared experiences that we wanted to capture. And so uh, my wife finally got sick of me talking about it. And one day just said, are we doing this or not? And that was really the kind of kick in the butt I needed. Uh, so I quit my job and, and, and started this. That was uh, about six years ago now. Wow. So now when we talk about a digital health community, you've built a Whopper. In fact, one that has as many registered users as people in the metropolitan area that Watson and I live in. Um, you, you've, you, have you really signed up over 2.5 million people into your community? Yeah, it's, a, it's actually over 3 million now. Wow. So, so you know, there's something we've talked about a lot here on, on the podcast is mainly related to marketplaces is that you can build a community or a marketplace or something. And the, just because you build it doesn't mean that people are going to come and populate it. Mm -hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to actually, you know, cause like I said, we could, it, it's building the community. There's tools and stuff to do that building a marketplace you can do, but if there aren't buyers and sellers in it, or if there isn't a tribe or people that are in there that, that are going to discuss it. So, you know, how, how did you get this to the point where you've got such a massive amount of people that are coming in? Like, how did that start? Uh, well, I, I, I should probably say the way we didn't do it. Um, so we actually, okay. we have not used paid marketing to get there. It's all been organic. Um, and the way we started is just with content. So when I looked at the opportunity, um, I thought I had a really creative idea at first. And then the more I you know looked into it, I realized there's a lot of health communities out there. 
um, but no one had really grown one to scale. And so I, that was really my, you know, focus. How could you build one at scale? Um, and so um, I did it through content. Um, that's the point I knew coming out of journalism is, you know, creating great content and then building the community off of that content. So we really started this. We bootstrapped it again about six years ago. And I hired a, uh, one of the top writers at Huffington Post to join, join me. And it was just the two of us at the beginning. And our goal was to do three stories a day. And her job was, um, Meg's job, who's, she's still our editor in chief today. Her job was to find three great stories that were out there. Uh, uh, first person stories of people writing about their own healthcare experiences. And my job was to find um, people that would really resonate with that online. Right. And we tried and failed a lot of different ways. Uh, but, you know, every few days we'd find something that worked pretty well. And then it was about replicating those successes um, over time. And it, within about five months, we had about 500,000 readers. And then it was a matter of converting those readers into community members um, through email sign up and, and things like that. Um, and then over the, over the course of time, we we did raise money. Uh, and that helped us build a team, both from a content perspective, a tech perspective. And uh, and then it was just just continuing to learn from what worked, throwing out the things that didn't work and and uh, and enabling the people within the community to help us grow it. That was a big piece of it, too. Well, Mike, I'm going to I'm going to say that you're you're a very humble guy because you say you raised a little bit of money. Twenty two point seven million dollars to date is a little more than a little money. Um, so, you know, one, one thing, and, and I do commend you on the approach that you're taking for building communities. I'm a big believer in the tribe building mentality, uh, meaning you got to get the people in the tribe to find as much value from each other as they do from whatever they're there for originally. But in order to attract that kind of investment capital, you have to generate revenue somehow. So how does that occur within the digital health community? Is this, is this can I join for free or is it like, is it paid or how does that, how did, how did you work that out? Yeah, everyone joins for free. And, and um, yes, we've raised a fair amount of money, but it didn't happen all at once, right? It, it's this, uh, I think of it as milestone funding. You say, hey, here's what we're going to go out and do. And you prove it, that you can do something, then you raise a little bit more. And then you prove the next milestone, then you raise a little mm -hmm. bit more. So, um, but for us, uh, so most of our revenue does come in through um, advertising. We didn't actually start monetizing until about two years ago. So most of the history of the company was really focused on growing the community first and finding investors who believed in the value of what we were doing for users and believed as, as we grew it, that we could find a way um, toward eventually being a profitable company. Uh, and so advertising um, accounts for most of our revenue today, although now we're really seeing a lot more opportunity in um, providing uh, healthcare companies insights into what people are thinking and feeling. Uh, for instance, we've done 60,000 surveys um, just in the last few weeks around how people are being impacted by coronavirus. Um, so, so Matt, like we hear from folks like you who say that, you know, you're cutting your own hair and you need, you need support. And yeah. so, um, and so, but companies it looks like I have a weird health condition, dude, I'll tell you what, you know, before we, before we got hooked up, I, I mentioned to Matt, I just thought it was, it was reasonable to remind him that there's a few things in life that they say you shouldn't do yourself and cutting your own hair is one of them. But, uh, so as we were getting ready to record uh, and we can see each other. So we use a, a virtual studio and Matt said, man, I cut my own hair today and I couldn't do any, I couldn't reply any other way, but <laughs> yeah, I, I can tell. Um, so now, now, you know, let's, let's take this down to the, to the, uh, uh, kind of a more user level. So Matt has, has one of his children has a nut allergy. I mean, is this, is this, is this community as, precise as discussing like i mean is it anything and everything can i build my own like i mean matt where as you've have you've learned at matt as you've learned more about that and your child like where did you find information and how do you figure out if it's any good or not you know it's been it's been several years you know since he was first diagnosed so i don't even remember but i'm sure it was just random google searching just kind of like math uh, mike mentioned when he you know started this like that's how you you look for these things, you just start randomly searching the internet, trying to find weird symptoms or what's going on. And yeah, 
which you can oftentimes like I had a headache and went to look it up. And like after about 15 minutes on Google, I then had cancer, nine different types yeah. of viruses and a lot of other stuff. So, so Mike, how, how do, how does a platform like the mighty? And once again, for those of you listening, go to the mighty.com or if you want to check out social media at the mighty site. Um, so how, how do you, how do, when your community gets as big and broad and vast as having 3 million people in it, do, what do you have to do about that data? Like, I mean, how do you how do you make sure that it's reasonable? So there's a number of ways we, we you know, we kind of look at it. So one is um, we say we're, a, you know, a three million member community, which is true, but it's really made up of a lot of small communities. Right. And so people can find if they go there, there's large ones like uh, mental health is kind of, I'd say, the largest bucket of communities. Um uh, depression, anxiety, you know, very large. And then you have much smaller ones and things like schizophrenia. And, you know, as you get down into more precise, you know, kind of topics. Um, and so, uh, you know, rare disease is something we're strong in. We have over a thousand different rare disease communities, you know, on on the mighty. It's not necessarily a large number of people, but the the power that those people have on each other's, you know, the impact is quite strong because they're all, they're complete strangers. And yet their, um, their experiences, they bond over, you know, dealing with the same types of things. And so um, today or up to, up till now, most people have found those communities um, by starting a hashtag and that uh, other people kind of follow those hashtags. We're doing something new um, just within the last month or so is um, in, in terms of creating new groups with assigned community leaders. Um, and those are growing at a, at, a, at a fast pace. Again, that's just within the last month. Um, and those will be able to turn into that um, each person could, could kind of um, invite folks into their own, their own community that can be made private, um, you know, those types of things. Because at the beginning we launched it, it was all, uh, it was all you know, big public platform. Uh, but we've evolved from, again, it started with stories and then the engagement was so high on those. We just listened to the community and they said, well, we, we don't want to just have to, you know, go to your editors and submit a story and then see if it gets published. Like, I just want to say what I'm dealing with right now, right? Not in necessarily a, a, um, a published format, but something more like you would, you know, post to Facebook or, um, you know, those types of things. And so we allowed more of that user generated content and it kind of just took off from there as people, you know, were able to express themselves in the ways they wanted to in a really safe and supportive community. That's critical. I think for us is, um, it's 24 seven moderated by humans. There's a lot of technology behind it as well. So we can flag, you know, uh, flag things and, and make sure that, you know, when people open up about what they're dealing with, they have to do it in a space that's, that they feel really safe in. And so that's, um, we, we put a lot of uh, time and energy into that. So do you, so do you have topics that are more general? Like I have a stomach problem. I have no idea what the hell it is, but this is what's going on. But then you probably have topics that are specific to diverticulitis and IBS or whatever, right? Like, but, but a lot of people, they don't know where to start. Like, I don't know what I have, right? But I can go talk about with other people maybe that have some clue and work with the community to help sort of diagnose this stuff. That's right. So, uh, and that's where a lot of people start. Like our, uh, the technology behind um, what we're doing can pick up, you know, if you say, you know, stomach problems or whatever, and that's going to end up um, helping you find uh, more content that may be related to that. Um, and it can help us discover that, hey, there's more of issues around this. This is we have, where we have to start building, you know, more community, um, you know, creating a space where, where more of that can happen. So, uh, um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of people that come in. I mean, we have a large group just under uh, undiagnosed, right? They're dealing with something, but they're not sure what it is. So, you know, all right. It's something that, that I, I'm immediately finding fascinating is you said you haven't you hadn't raised or monetized the platform until a couple of years ago, but you have a six year history. Yeah. What's it like raising more than twenty million dollars from venture capitalists and telling? I mean, it's uh, now I'm, I'm assuming that I had to start before you started quote monetizing the platform. Am I right? That's right. So, um, I so how, how do you sell that? How do you walk into that pitch meeting? And you're like, I've got this huge community. And they're like, what? And you know how VCs are. What? Well, what do you? What's your monetization model? What's your? You know, what's your burn rate? Blah 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 blah. And you're like, well, we haven't monetized it yet, and but we think this will work. I mean, did you have to prove the concept or like I don't know? Like, how do you go? How do you pull that off? Teach us. So you, you tell a good story. I mean, that's that's a big piece of it. Um, and I think you know, different companies raise money for, for different reasons and in different ways. And for us, it was really about the traction that within a few months of 
launching this that we had a half million people reading it, right? Reading the content we were producing um, just with one editor and me, right? And uh, and that was it. And so that was in terms of initially getting small checks, you know, $50,000 from one person or another. Um, and that enabled us to kind of start down that path of, um, of again, with uh, through growth of more content and beginning the technology, you know, piece. Um, so, but yes, over time, it was a matter of, hey, look at what we're, we're building and here are the ways like we wanted to focus on the growth aspect first. Uh, that was a better, I think, story for us and, and a proof point that we could actually really build a large community. So by the time we actually monetized it, we could tell folks we're already the largest. We're the largest health community out there. Um, and so we're not we're not a mature business. There are companies out there that are 15 years old um, that have done very well in the space. We focused on the growth and building a brand, building trust with our community, all of those pieces. And with additional capital that you would be investing, we can help. You know, we will now grow this as a as a real business. And here are the folks that we're going to be bringing in to help us do that. Um, so there is a lot of trust, you know, in that that you've got to have with investors. They've got to, you know, uh, believe that we're going to be able to accomplish it. But you can also them show show you show them the track record and saying, here's what I did when I put my own money in to start it. Right. Here's how far we got. And then we raised this much money. and We said we were going to go do these things. And we did all those things. And, you know, you just showed the track record that you have um, and the type of people, you know, it's basically the, the team that we were building and the traction that we had is what investors really bought into. So you, if I was just blindly discussing this with you and you t- you said, hey, Matt, I, I, I want to start a digital health community. What should I be worried about? I, I think the first thing that comes into my head is liability. Um, I, you know, and maybe, and, and that's leading to my question is if for those that may already have some kind of community, what are the things that you need to w- look out for? And I, and I say liability because anything that's medical, if you're not an MD, I mean, you, you're telling us that you have a history as a journalist, which means that you aren't licensed to give medical advice, <laughs> I'm but, but 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 that's a, but that's a good point because like even in our episodes of Startup Hustle where we've talked okay so when we talked about PPP loans, yep. I started the episode by saying hey this is about our experience this is not advice we are not yep. we are not licensed de- broker dealers of financial services I'm not a CPA you know all these different things so like it I. I'm assuming that's one of the things you have to give some credence to, but what are some of the other, what are some of the other things that you, you advise someone to avoid? I'd say there's two ways to look at it and and you have to look at both of them. So one is the, just the legal side of it. Right. And so th- through things like your privacy policies, your terms and conditions, all of those things that we, you know, we, we put money to lawyers to help us figure out is making sure that you're buttoned up there. Um, in terms of that there's not liability um, and that when someone signs up, they understand that there's not, that you're not telling them what to do and, and things like that. Um, so there's the legal side, um, which is important for a lot of reasons, but then there's also just the culture that you want to build within the community itself. And for people to understand that these are, you know, uh, folks with shared experiences that are not necessarily, I mean, we do have licensed therapists on our platform as well. About 15% of all of our uh, members are actual, uh, you know, come, they're, they're healthcare providers. Um, but, uh, but even with them, they're not, they're not promising that like they're giving you care necessarily licensed care. Um, and so number one is legal. Number two is culture, like build in the right culture where people understand this is a, gr- a bunch of peers, right? Um, it, this is uh, peer supported, um, not not through again licensed therapy or or something like that. If you were building a telehealth company, it would be different. We are not a telehealth company, um, and so I think you want to be clear with users as to you know who you are and what you're trying to do and what you're there to help them with, um, and that you you listen to them as well. I mean, it's a big part of of the value of using your platform, though. And is this maybe part of the way that you monetize it is connecting random people like me with a doctor or therapist that's familiar with these specific, you know, chronic illnesses? So that's a uh, so we're not doing that as much as I'd like to today, but it is part of the long term roadmap. Um, Think of us as like when I think of other social network, like a Facebook or an Instagram, those are generally networks of uh, people that, you know, friends and family. Whereas the mighty is really a network of complete strangers. Mm -hmm. Uh, 
that you, the connections happen because of the shared experiences that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next step for us as we evolve that is, um, you know, Matt, if you've got, you know, a kid with a nut allergy, if you were to sign on, how beneficial would it be if we could tell you all the specialists in Kansas City that you could potentially go see? Um, we don't have that yet, but that that's something that we want to evolve into in, in terms of our first goal is to really connect people and then connecting, adding resources, adding all these other things, services, all of those types of things, um, which would come next. Yeah. I mean, it seems like your platform could be a lead generator for these yeah. service providers, you know, um, maybe the allergy one isn't the best example, but maybe it's like I have diverticulitis or whatever. And there's no maybe- that. I don't know, but maybe, maybe that's something that, you know, it's harder to find a specialist and I don't know where I would even find that specialist, but if I can go to your site and instantly be connected to somebody who is like an industry expert at that, yep. it doesn't matter where they're at, that then I can do telemedicine with, like, to me, that would seem really valuable, but. Yeah. yeah those are all on our product roadmap of, you know, um, I tried to simplify it for a team and it was about content first because and then we were able to get content out there you know we've had um literally billions of views on fifty thousand written stories and about a thousand videos that we've done and by doing that first um it was a matter of we've got we're building a brand we're getting you know helpful information helpful you know emotional stories from people out there and then having some small percentage say hey i want to be a part of this so the first step was content um, then it was really the, the human connections that we're forming. Um, and that we're in that kind of phase two is we're, is we're bringing those together. The next step is resources. So exactly what you're, you're talking about. And then beyond that, it's actually all the services that we could potentially provide. So, um, it's a, it's a long-term roadmap. It doesn't all <laughs> yeah. you know, right away, but to me, it's a matter of, you know, healthcare is hard for folks and, uh, I, you know, I, I live through it and, um, am living through it and I, I, it should just be easier. We should help people like just navigate through all of the BS. Um, and if we can do a good job of that, um, we'll, we'll just continue to grow in size, I think. Well, I, I think part of the problem, and this is part of what you're trying to solve is if I've got a cold or strep throat or whatever, you know, it's easy to go to any doctor and, uh, mm -hmm. even like a general nurse can probably help me, right? Like I can go to the minute clinic at CVS probably and they can help me. But if I have anything else that's kind of like an order of magnitude more complicated, it's very difficult to find somebody who has expertise. And so, you know, if you can be the place that people go when they need that level of expertise, you know, it solves a big problem. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the, at the end of the day, we just really, we built this because we wanted to help people um, mm -hmm. get and manage whatever they're dealing with. And the simpler we can make it, the easier we can make it for them, um, the better it's, it's going to be. And we started with just the just the, the support. I mean, I didn't, I really didn't know until we were about a year, maybe even two years into it, that what we were ultimately solving for is isolation. Um, when you are dealing with something and, and you don't know how to talk to your friends and family about it because they probably can't help and you just don't know where to go. Uh, but there are so many people out there that are that, that are maybe a year ahead of where you're at, right? And dealing with whatever it is. And so um, how do how do we pull those people in together? Um, and especially right now, if we're solving for isolation, like when have people been more isolated than <laughs> than right now or, you know, six yeah. weeks, ago, you know, coronavirus. And, and uh, it's, you know, it's an odd time. We all have mental health issues at this point. I, I think, I, you know, I've been sitting here, I'm sitting here thinking that, you know, it's great to have the input from the therapists, but it's the empathetic point of view that is the, is in my opinion, the strongest thing that has been mentioned here. And especially if it's across a widespread, because look, sometimes like, okay, so you, you, ha you, both of you are, are parents to children that have something that threatens an overall you know, like with, well, it, with the nut allergy, like that could, I almost fed your kid nuts at your wedding, Matt. Like, and I'm sorry, like, I mean, it wasn't that it wasn't nuts. It was ice cream. And he was sitting there looking at it. I said, do you want some ice cream? And he said, it, it's, is it safe? And I felt terrible. I was like, oh my God, I was going to give him ice cream and I don't know. And, you know, but on the, on the flip side of that too, with a widespread. So, so I suffer from something that is not life threatening. It is just annoying. I have a weird form of patellar tendinosis, which uh, which causes me extreme pain above my kneecap. 
A lot of people experience it underneath the knee, but mine is above, which is like really rare. And honestly, I've learned more from commu- digital community sites <laughs> similar to the Mighty that like uh, for people that actually have it, because like even my doctor was like, that's really weird. It shouldn't occur above your knee. I'm like, thanks for telling me that. That really brought a whole lot of value. You yeah. know, and they're, they're like, have you put ice, ice on it? I'm like, I'm like, yeah, I've tried ice. Thanks. Yeah, every I'm day. Like, I'm, glad I, I'm, I'm glad I came in, but But, you know, but actually getting information from like a very weird, like very targeted number of people that were actually talking about that Mm -hmm. enabled me to make some simple changes and it doesn't cause a problem. But I mean, it's to the point, like it would be the point that in certain cases it was unbearable for me to sit still. Um, so, you know, having, having the strength in the community of people that were going through the same thing had just gone through years of trial and error was far more valuable than the medical input that I just mentioned I got. So, I mean, I think if we can find, uh, I might start a community at the mighty.com for Watson's haircut problem, but (laughs) because I feel, I feel that that's a problem we're solving right now. I see a lot of people threatening to cut their own hair right now. So, um, okay. So, (laughs) so Mike, here we are. We're, we're, we're six years. The Mohawk yesterday. So, so he had long floppy hair and he was just done with it. So, uh, so I went out and got the clippers at Walgreens and, and gave him a mohawk and he's nice. much happy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too far away from that, except for the problem is my mohawk area is where my hair is thinned the most. So I'm not sure it'll come out well. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've also threatened to, to, to finally grow a comb over, um, which my wife is starting to feel like she's taking that threat seriously. So, uh, all right. So Mike, here we are, we're, we're coming up on six years into this for you. You've raised a lot of money. You've got quite a few people working for you. What's the forward path with the mighty? I mean, what's it like, because you've already, I mean, 3 million people, you got in my notes say that you have a new user sign up every 20 seconds. So, I mean, a couple hundred people have signed up already during (laughs) while we've been recording that. I mean, what, what's the, where do you go with that? Well, I I really believe that um, I'd like us to be really the face of consumer health globally. And I know that's a a big ambition, but I look at it as anywhere, anybody, anywhere around the world who just discovers they're going to deal with something, you know, they just got diagnosed or maybe they haven't been diagnosed, but they're dealing with something. I really believe that a community of people you know, just the wisdom of, of that community can be extremely helpful to them. And uh, and that's just the starting point, as we were talking earlier. Then what would come after that is, you know, okay, now that I know this, what do I do next, right? And and the, the Mighty would help them be able to answer those questions. Again, find the right resources, the services, all of those things to be able to get um, better care and just, just manage it all better. And the emotional side of that is, is huge. So, um, I mean, we are talking about a television show. We're talking about ways to really get the brand out there in bigger ways. Um, a third of our community is outside the U.S. Um, people have used the Mighty in over 70 different languages so far. Wow. Um, I, I would love to tell you that we know what they're saying. We don't. <laughs> um, we just, you know, we need more engineers. We need, you know, more people to to help build this out that will make it uh, much easier, you know, for folks. So, uh, but I, I just think at the end of the day, this should be, you know, we, there's so much talk about how to improve healthcare. Um, and then yes, it's policy ori- oriented, but it's also just user oriented, right? It's just like making it easier to find what you need or what's going to be helpful. And I think if you've got that in your pocket, you know, um, we, you know, we, after starting the website, it's moved to both iOS and Android apps. Um, it's just a, a place that should be really helpful. Uh, and so it's all the things we need to do to, to kind of um, build that and, and, and take it further. Have you seen just general traffic, page turns, usership and everything go up significantly for uh, this year due to COVID-19? Uh, th- within COVID-19 specifically, yes. I mean, that's so much of the conversation that's happening right now. Um, we've got a daily email that's up to, I think it's about 600,000 people now just around COVID-19 um, that we're sending out. Wait, you're, you're emailing 600,000 people a day just about COVID-19? Yes. Wow. Um, and that's where we're getting all these survey responses. When we're asking folks about, 
what their, you know, experiences, you know, are like. Um, and it's a, it's a mix. When we think of email, we don't think of just broadcasting our content out. It's a matter of a place that's, you know, offering feedback that, you know, for folks to come in. And that was when we talked about when this, you know, all got started, uh, uh, coronavirus, we, you know, had an internal discussion about what's the right role for the mighty to play in all this. I mean, we produce a lot of content, but we're not going to, you know, as, as someone who used to work for the New York Times, we're not going to compete with the New York Times in terms of all the original, you know, reporting we're going to do, um, you know, so, but what is the right role? And we felt like we're really a place that has a pulse on how people are dealing with this. So we went all in on kind of the survey side um, of all the, you know, capturing all the information and CNN's covered us and, and other places have covered what we're doing um, to really get a sense of how is this impacting people's daily lives, not just those who've tested positive, but, the, you know, I mean, for us with four kids at home, man, homeschooling is hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, uh, my daughter's therapies have all gone away, right? For, you know, um, it, it's it, these are the, the, the ins and outs. Um, and then the next step of those things, we launched a study with UCLA around, um, you know, kids with neuro de, uh, neuro, neurodevelopmental disorders and what are families doing around all the, the care that they used to, you know, have. So, um, it's, uh, it's being able to have that conversation with folks, um, the trust that we have built up with the community. Um, it leads to so many, you know, again, great things. I mean, all the research studies that we're doing right now just comes from the fact that we have people who want their voices heard and are willing to, you know, share them. Well, I think that that's, that's key. Now you mentioned something about competition. So we're going to, we're going to allow you into, the competition that we have each episode of Startup Hustle, uh, and that's by playing Mixtape the Game. Uh, for those of you listening, you can go to mixtapethegame.com, you can, or you can download Mixtape the app, and you can play in the group room uh, available on iOS and Android. Works best if you have a Spotify premium account. Now, I, uh, it, I'm i assuming you have yet to play Mixtape the Game, Mike. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So I'm going to pull it. I pulled a card from the mixtape deck and I'm going to name a scenario and we're all going to name a song that we think best fits that scenario. We will vote for a winner. You may not vote for yourself. Um, amazing the way this stuff works out with you being in California, this song, this scenario is what is the best song about California? Hmm. And I'm going with California by Tupac. Wow. There's so many obvious answers. Well, I mean, the first one jumped in my mind was Hotel California. Um, is that too, is that too cliche? It may be. That's, that's the point. Um, what's the, uh, uh, shoot, what's the one I'm thinking about? The Red Hot Chili Peppers song. Mm. Californication. Yeah. I might go with that one. Okay. Which is probably going to leave Watson with Hotel California, I have a feeling. No, I got to go with Katy Perry's California Girls. Ah, ah, there was a lot of choice, a lot of obvious choices here. All right. So I'm not a Katy Perry fan, but oh. I, like the, I, I, I like the Chili Peppers. So Mike's got my vote. Uh, me too. I'm going with the Chili Peppers. That was actually the song I was thinking of too. So, Well, you already won. You don't even have to vote. You can if you'd like, but... Um, much, much like some of the, the elections over the last 20 years, your vote may not be counted effectively. Um, I, I, I'd go with Katy Perry number two. Oh yeah. Hey, ah, <laughs> yeah. Maybe we should instill an electoral college type system for mixtape voting, Matt. What do you think? Mm. It is an elect. It's an election year. I mean, we could look at some different stuff. Once again, if you're interested in playing mixtape, the game, check out the app. It's a lot of fun. You learn a heck of a lot of stuff about the people, you know? So, all right. Uh, with that, that brings us near the end with us today. We had Mike Perath, who's the CEO and founder of the mighty, a massive digital health community. You can find it at the mighty.com. You can find it all over the social medias by searching at the mighty site. So we end our episodes of Startup Hustle. And once again, thank you for joining us today, Mike. It's time for the Founders Freestyle. We're going to pass the mic around. We are going to get the Founders Freestyle gives all of our guests and us a chance to resolve anything we may have left out, give advice or whatever. Uh, I think perhaps 
I, I, I will offer a suggestion, but leave it up to you as how to answer. Uh, you clearly have some deep insight into raising capital. That is always a top, uh, hot topic. Um, you, I, I would be interested in your take on when a company should, shouldn't, and maybe what kind of companies should or shouldn't raise money. I'll leave that up to you as if you want to field that question before we pass the mic to Master Watson and then back to myself. Yeah, I, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, I think that um, I think most companies should not raise venture capital money. Um, it really depends on what you're trying to build. Um if you have an idea that is very big, that investors would have a very big return on, um, then it can make sense. Um, if you're building more of a lifestyle business, um, I think you're, you, you may hurt yourself if you end up taking money from uh, investors like that. So it really depends on what the ambition is, um, the size you believe you can grow it into, and knowing that um, this is not free money that you're taking <laughs> from, from investors. Um, it really is, uh, you have to believe that you're really going to return, give them a very large return if you, you know, you're going to have to grow something big and meaningful. Um, and so it's it's not for most companies, I think. Um, but uh, for those, um, there's also the time frame of the speed at which you need to to grow uh, is challenging. Um, there's a lot of pressure. So um, I don't think it's for you know for all companies, um, but for those that you know, have big ambitions and believe um, they can really um, return money for investors um, and that that capital is going to help you grow into something much, much bigger, much more scalable, then it can, it can be um, a great, you know, source of, um, of building. I, I have a follow on for you. Um, how, how about your just general advice for people that are, I mean, I, a lot of people have started communities and stuff like that. I mean, and, and not, and most aren't, it, it, none have 3 million in them like you, but they can be effective on a, on a small level too. If you're just trying to start a, an online community in general, whether it's digital health or anything else, what's a, what's a couple tips you can give a listener about how to do that and do it well. So number one is you have to figure out what's the value that you're providing to that end user. If there's not real value, it's going to be so hard to grow it. Um, um, and another thing would be find a way, you know, leverage the community that you're building. So you will never be able, like, I could never build a three person, a three million member community. I needed to build a 300 person community and they helped build a 3000 person community. And so you leverage all of the people that are, that are there. Um, you ha that means you have to give them a voice. You have to, um, at some point stop talking, <laughs> Right. And letting letting them um, have the platform. I don't look at this as, you know, my company or anything like that. It's a matter of I may have started it, but this is really this is this, it's the community now. It's theirs. Um, and we're we listen to them. We build what they ask us to build. Um, it, it's you know, we're in more service to them. So if you're starting a community, how can you be in service of those people that you that you you know want to attract? Master bad haircut. Oh, come on. Um you know, I I think it's amazing the the business you've built, and I'll be the first one to say that it is not the kind of business I would ever try and build. You know, trying to I'm not honestly personally not a fan of like B two C you know business to consumer stuff and ad supported. You know, that's a tough business to build. It's really really tough. Um, it's a lot easier when you're selling something to another business and you know who to call. I call them up on the phone and can sell them something right. Where you're relying on like this network effect of how do we get you know, at the beginning, hundreds and then thousands and now millions of people to a site and then monetize it. And it's very difficult business to do. So for those that are listening, you know, kudos to you, you, you accomplished this. And there are other people listening that have the same idea. It's, it's a very difficult thing to do. So um, at 100% advertised or supported, uh, especially in a world now where everybody has ad blockers and all this no JavaScript tracking and like all the stuff, right? It's, it becomes harder and harder to monetize the traffic. And so big kudos for you for, for accomplishing it. So. Thanks. And, and it did start with advertising. You know, that's, that's becoming less and less of, uh, we're trying to rely less and less on that. Um, as someone who has worked in media for over 20 years, um, media businesses are very, very difficult. So we, we, that's, it, it is how we started more as a publisher than we evolved into more of a social network. And now we're evolving even more into a digital health platform. And so the ways we monetize, you know, are evolving. Um, but uh, media is a very, very difficult game. You have to be in an, a, a really large player. Uh, I think in the long run to be successful, J just pure media. 
Once again with us today on Startup Hustle, which was brought to you by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. We had Mike Harath, Parath, the CEO and founder of The Mighty. Find him at themighty.com. Um, you know, as, as I wrap up here uh, and, and weigh in it, with my founders, Freestyle, I, I, first off, I want to commend you for what you've done. Um, uh, uh, so many meaningful things have started with a selfless approach you know, and that's helping others. Um, I think one of the things that you've, you've clearly done on this masterful level is build a tribe. And I've talked a lot on this show about tribe building. Seth Godin has a book called Tribes. It's very powerful. It's a very powerful thing. And I feel if you have the ability or, or can build a tribe in and around whatever it is, it, it could be a topic, it could be a business, it could be any of that. You end up with a very, very, very powerful thing. Now, in order to do that, you have to listen to many of the things that Mike hit on here. Well, first off, you got to create some content and you have to do it in a quality way. Uh, this is coming from someone who's been in mainstream media, has worked for the New York Times and ABC News and other and stuff like that. Um, you know, one thing that my book editor taught me is you need to lead with a need. And uh, I think they say that on the news too, don't they? Uh, and, and the reason for that is because you have to get someone's attention. There's a lot of content out there. Some of it's okay. Some of it's good. And very little of it is high quality. And high quality content is thought out. It, prevent, it presents some kind of value, which needs to either entertain people, it needs to educate them, or it needs to be compassionate. And, you know, if you can, and, and so that's valuable content. And if you can facilitate the ability for people to interact with each other and they're doing it in your ecosystem, they will bring other people, they will create the content for you. They can do a whole lot of stuff and you might be onto something. Uh, if you are planning on building a community, you have to give a lot of thought and consideration to how you're going to get some people to even show up yep. because that empty marketplace thing, it's that chicken and the egg. I, I, I've seen some people uh, comment recently. They said, I just ordered a chicken and an egg on Amazon. I'll let you know. Um, <laughs> so, but, but that's the thing. I, and I say that I even wrote about it in million dollar bedroom. I literally built my own classified ad sites and then was like, oh, wow it's kind of hard to get people to come in here. So you got to give some consideration to that. And that's as big of a challenge, I think, on many levels as it is building and keeping an effective community going. So, well, with all that said, and all of the uh, all of the issues around Watson's uh, self-created haircut, I think I'm going to go to themighty.com and create a community. I'll see you guys next time. Thanks, everybody. All right. Thanks, guys.